someone who is fresh out of Harvard Business School has no experience in building, operating a startup, will be an Excel venture capitalist, will never deeply understand the tra- market share grabbing is helpful mm. if it creates an entry Let barrier for new players. Right. If it cannot create entry barriers for new players, then there's no, there doesn't help you in any way. I think founders have to discover what scale means to them. Following is a conversation with Hari TN, the co-founder of Arta School of Entrepreneurship and the co-author of Winning Middle India. In this conversation, Hari throws light on consumption behavior of Middle India. What does it take to build for the next 700 million Indians? How do you achieve operational efficiencies when building for these Indians? How do you identify the right set of problems? How do you leverage technology to solve these problems? How do you go about building strong teams? How do you retain talent? How do you um, raise leaders within your organization? How do you go about fundraising? When to raise funds? Um, Whom to raise funds from? What are the ideal traits of the investor that you bring to your cap table? And many more such topics. Hari is also a LinkedIn top voice, and he throws light on his approach towards creating content. I found this conversation very insightful, and it changed the way I thought about building startups, raising funds, and the consumption behavior of Middle India. But most importantly, it changed the way I thought about achieving product market fit. Hari explains beautifully about how do you know if you've achieved product market fit, whether you should double down on your efforts, or maybe pivot and find a better idea. Um, or maybe re, revisit your entire approach uh, towards the idea and the business that you are into. I hope you find this conversation insightful. Thank you for watching Curiously with KVK. Good morning, Hari, sir. Thanks for taking time to chat with me. Uh, I, I, having spent 20 years in, in the startup space, what's what's one thing that still excites you every morning? Um particularly to even, you know, speak to young entrepreneurs like me. What what brings you to this conversation today? So I think uh, I love speaking to young entrepreneurs. So that's the reason why I'm here. And uh, I think uh, I'm really at this point of time doing things that I really am passionate about. So when you're passionate about something, uh, you don't need anything to wake you up the next day. And uh, you're always excited. So I think at this point of time, I'm just enjoying my life. Fantastic. So you recently wrote about this, wrote this book on winning middle India, right? Yes. Um, and the, you know, success stories of some startups that have been operating in the space, maybe in the last five to 10 years. And uh, you you sort of highlighted uh, some points that people need to pick up in order to uh, cater to the middle India. So according to you, what exactly is middle India? And what do you think defines the traits of middle India and the consumer behavior of middle India? Yes, so there is no rigid definition of Middle India. So the way we've looked at it, um, I think is clearly there in the book. The, you know, you have an upper, uh, you know, uh, 70 odd million Indians. The next 500 million Indians, um, you know, with some disposable incomes in the range of, uh, you know, uh, 4 to 20 lakhs is what we broadly call, uh, per annum is what we broadly call Middle India. Uh, I think, you know, if you remember a very old book, uh, sometimes written in 2006, this was written by Rama Bijapurkar, titled, We Are Like That Only. So in that book, for the first time, I think someone had attempted to talk about uh, Middle India in some ways, because at that point of time, the rising middle class was talked about a lot. And uh, many companies in the Western world were, you know, quite intrigued and keen to know more about uh, what this Middle India animal is all about. So she wrote that book, uh, even before she wrote that book, many of them were excited by the large market opportunity and came and set up shop in India. Some were disappointed, some were quite okay, some learned their lessons. But I think the book um, by Rama Bijapurkar actually brought out the nuances of middle India. And I think uh, from the time she wrote the book till now, some things have changed. And the headline itself has changed. Headline then was, you know what, we are like that only. I don't think we are like that only anymore. (laughs) So for instance, uh, you know, you have uh, several, uh, you know, uh, developments in terms of technology. For example, you have Aadhaar, you have UPI. Many of, many of these amazing public goods that have been created, the rails that have been created and the standards that have been laid out for others to build upon have been quite amazing. And along with um, uh, this uh, entrepreneurial energy and venture capital that's now ab- available in the abundance in India, for the first time, many of these problems that could never be solved profitably by founders and entrepreneurs are now within reach. In the past also, this market segments existed, but then it was very difficult to build products and services profitably because 
Their consumption habits were very conservative. Their per capita incomes were low. Their expectations in terms of what a good product they would pay for was very different. Their product performance or price performance expectation were very different, which meant that for the same quality of performance, they would want a product at a much lower price. Or for the same price, they would want much higher level of performance as compared to those in the upper end of the pyramid. So I think building products for middle India has always been difficult. Why middle India? Building products for anyone in the world who don't have disposable income or very, very picky and choosy about the kind of things that they would like to consume is, has always been very difficult. It's never been very easy, except that once you, you know, uh, meet every single need of the top end of the pyramid, now you certainly need to find innovative ways of targeting the next set of consumers, even if their you know, disposable income uh, is low. So I think that's the way I would put it. So when we speak about this middle India and you say, you know, disposable income of the order of, let's say, maybe early five digits per month. Um, and it, let's say a ton of these companies are trying to target this particular segment. Um, th there's just abundance of competition trying to, uh, you know, bet on this finite pocket. How do you how do you tackle this? Uh, wh what's, uh, according to you, the set of things that, you know, middle India is willing to spend on? Yeah, so I don't uh, know what you mean by exactly by tackle this because everybody is certainly, you know, vying for the same wallet share. Yeah, and that's the way the world operates is the way the economy operates. If you have, let's say, 100 million top of the pyramid consumers, there are companies and startups that are trying to vie for the same wallet share producing, you know, multiple products and services. Then the wrong assumption that we always make is that 100 million is going to remain 100 million or 50 million will remain 50 million. But the point is that, you know, as more and more producers come and take that wallet share, they in turn money falls into their pockets. So the wallet share is not restricted. It's not like there are 500 million Indians. You know, there are people taking away that wallet share. How much wallet can you take? But as people take more and more wallet share, the money goes into their wallets. Now they mm -hmm. can begin to spend in turn. So that's the way the economy operates. It's not a, you know, finite sum game where, you know, it's not a zero sum game where there's some wallet available. The wallets keep getting created as the economic activity keeps increasing. So that way I would see, you know what, economic activity is like this. It's not about, you know, taking a fixed amount of wallet share. It's about creating new wallets as well. So in terms of what they're willing to consume, I think they're willing to consume many things. Um, as I we said, have said in the book, you know, there are different kinds of middle India. There are some people in middle India who are very aspirational, who would want to consume everything that the top of the pyramid people are consuming, but may not want to be the, pay the same price. They may not care about brands as much as those in the upper classes, but they would want the same kind of products, may not be very branded and may not be very high priced. There are some other people who will consume slightly differently, but I think uh, some of the principles of building these products remain essentially the same, which is you need to build based on trust. As, as trust is a very important element when you build for these kinds of populations. And um, you need to start small. You can't miss sell. You can't mislead. You can't, you know, do anything. You have to build a business the hard way and create the trust. And then once having created the trust, you can try and build um, other products using that trust. Once you've been successful in a particular product or service, you can go ahead and, you know, create those adjacent products and services. But you need to take one thing, go deep into it, understand the customer expectations and create a lot of trust by which they will completely blindly trust in you and then are willing to bet on you for other products as well. You speak about this, um, you know, trust factor and uh, we having to meet, you know, a certain level of customer expectations that for one is universal across all businesses. But more importantly, when we speak about middle India, what, what do you think defines the characteristics of a business that operates here? Is it more of, let's say, brands or is it more of aggregator platforms? Is it more of uh, platforms that give better monetization opportunities to the middle India or how exactly do you see this? So I think uh, I, I don't know if I can put it in one, you know, bracket, all of these, for example, middle India has always existed. So for I, I, we, in that book, we talked of this idea of Sansilka Chota packet, where there was a very, you know, uh, uh, smart businessman in a small town in Tamil Nadu called Kadlur, where he figured out that, you know, consumers in this particular bracket, will are open to consuming products like shampoos and you know talcum powders that the upper classes consume except that they can't pay for big you know pack sizes because they right. don't have a reliable cash flow as a result of which he figured out that if you can sell them in small sachets or yeah. sachets that's when people would buy and that's what really happened 
So the entire market got uh, uncovered because of that one single consumer insight. And HUL copied that insight of Chinni Krishnan and built out these entire Sansilka Chota Packet ka amazing products. And Sansilka Chota Packet sells much more than the bigger packets. So I think, so for example, I talked of Sansilk uh, in small packets, sashes being sold. Uh, so I think you can have all kinds of products and services that they are willing to consume, provided you're able to do that innovatively. So uh, I think that's the uh, really question, which is how do you distribute this uh, sachet very economically? Ultimately, you know, distributing these small sachets, I'm, I'm, I'm using sachet as a metaphor. It sure. could be a service, it could be yeah. a product. Delivering these small sachets economically, I think distribution is the key. So I think technology is also changing the way one is looking at distribution. Platforms, for example, have made it far more easy for people to distribute because those who are distributing services don't have to solicit and build markets. The markets tend to get created by these platforms. So these people end up only distributing their amazing products. So I think technology has helped unbundled unbundle some of these things that entrepreneurs do for a business and help them focus on what their core capability is. So the platforms have helped discoverability and these guys are involved in distribution, for instance. So I think um, it's not just platform. It's not just, um, you know, uh, the Chota packets. It's many things. It's as, as, as things that are done innovatively for them. So when we speak of, uh, you know, uh, catering to the segment, are you are you saying that there is an already enough platforms out there and the real innovation ha needs to happen in the last mile delivery tech or uh, in terms of how people perceive a certain brand, which might be, let's say, uh, how they discover a certain brand, maybe through influencer marketing, maybe through a certain content on social media. Is it is it more of the retail segment um, and the last mile segment that needs innovation in or is it more across the supply chain? Oh, I think it's across the supply chain. So it's, it's not that platforms all already exist and these guys have to just innovate on the last mile supply chain. So for example, if you take a company like Dehat, what they are doing is they're solving the problems of farmers. It's not just the last mile delivery of farmers. They're solving every single problem of a farmer. So what these guys do is they talk to farmers and figure out why they're not making the kind of money that they should be making. And then they begin to figure out that, you know what, they should be uh, using more cash crops in place of some of the other crops. What comes in the way of these guys going in for cash crops? Cash crops are new to them. So they'll have to begin to take risk. Then they don't want to take that risk because they're getting a certain amount of steady income every month into their pocket. Now, if they go in for a new crop with which they're not familiar with, then the risk of that steady income going away also exists. So then how do you talk to them out, talk them out of that attitude? Then you begin to tell them, you know what, we will take some of the risk on your behalf. So the heart can say, tell them we can take some of that risk on your behalf. And you can do this. We will get you the steady income. So I think innovative business models that can get people over those little humps of resistance in mindset is also helpful. Ultimately, you know what? There's a lot of resistance because of mindsets. You just need to go in at those points and figure out what's the reason why those mindsets exist, mindsets exist, and then help them overcome some of those. Once they see that it's working, then they begin to you know use them very effectively. So, for example, when online banking came, many of the older people you know, who were not comfortable with this, continued to go to the banks, to the bank branches for a long time, actually, until they figured out because some younger one in the family taught them and they realized life is very different to online banking. You can actually get your drafts at home, you demand drafts at home, you could transfer money, you could do so many things magically. Once they figured that out, then I think they began, you know, transacting online. And the same thing is true here as well. In the pandemic, many people were forced to transact online. They were trying, forced to try and buy rail tickets online. Sometimes they were forced to make payments, bill payments online. They did so many things. And once they overcame that resistance, then they began shopping. So I think it's about overcoming that resistance. Helping people overcome resistance is also one element of um, dealing with middle India. And Razor Pay that, did that in a very big way. They just went to small towns and helped people, you know, download that app, help them make transactions, made them realize that life can be very, very easy. So people yeah, are I think very comfortable. Bharat Pay did something similar with the Kirana stores as well. Yeah. Who? Yeah. Bharat Pay. Yeah. 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 Interesting. So uh, since you brought up Dehat, right, and you mentioned they offer sort of end to end services, trying to understand the core problems of the farmer and executing them till the end of the uh, cycle where, where the produce goes into the market, right? So when we speak about, uh, you know, building for this segment, uh, often there's, there's this. Uh, 
you know, belief that typically a startup needs to have a razor sharp focus on uh, a very niche vertical. Um, and here we're speaking about, you know, solving multiple problems, which might typically fall under multiple verticals, right? Uh, how do you uh, look at this imbalance? So mostly it's under one vertical here also. For example, Dihad is in the agri-tech vertical. Uh, razor yeah. pay was in the payments vertical. Credit B is in the fintech vertical. So many of the examples that we talked about broadly, you know, at least begin to begin with one very sharp, reasonably sharp vertical. Uh, okay, so let me rephrase that. What I would yeah. mean is, uh, let's say a platform like Dehat would have to speak to the farmers. One one of the challenges would be onboarding them to use an app. Correct. Second would be trying to get them to understand the operations of the app. Third yeah. would be trying to get them to sort of stick to what the app recommends or what the platform recommends yeah. and do that throughout the year. And the fourth challenge would be trying to, like you mentioned, uh, convince them why they should take risks and uh, go for these you know, cash crops as opposed to the steady flow of income. So from that perspective, I think it's like multiple problems at once that you got to solve. Yes, from that perspective, it's multiple problems. Uh, but the way they are doing it is that... Uh, they have a person interface, a human interface available always. So even uh, Razorpay had a human interface, which is they would do these melas in small towns, tier three towns, tier four towns, they would do these melas. And they would actually, you know, download the app, be available to solve their problems. So I think if we just download that app and disappear and not help through with the transactions, then it's going to be difficult. So even Dehat always has that human touch. There is a person, your neighborhood friend, a bunch of farmers have, has a neighborhood friend who then helps, uh, you know, the farmers uh, deal with all the problems that they may face uh, in, you know, operating that app for some time at least. So I think that for, uh, extending that helping hand till they get completely onboarded, not just onboarded for the sake of onboarding, till they begin to transact very comfortably, that uh, helping hand is always there. So to a fair degree, you would say that uh, there's, you know, on-ground operations involved and it's an oper on-ground operation intensive very, um, yes, space yes, to absolutely. operate in. Okay. Correct, correct. It's not just technology. It is very fairly uh, on-ground operations intensive as well. Interesting. So, uh, and okay, when we speak about it's, it's on-ground operation intensive, how do you sort of optimize for this? One thing we know is, since we're speaking about roughly 500 to 600 million Indians, there's there's enough scale available, so there's volume available. Um, uh, but the ticket sizes we're speaking, with, uh, speaking about is extremely low. So how do you sort of necessarily, uh, you know, op optimize for your operations and costs when it comes to operating in the space, the, is the key to sort of uh, decentralize it into multiple, uh, you, uh, you know, service providers. Let's say logistics is by, done by someone, uh, the packaging is done by someone, the, the retailing is done by someone. Is the key to sort of outsource each uh, operation to someone or do you think centralization helps in any way? I think multiple models are possible. I think broadly, when you solve problems for middle India and lower India, it is very important to leverage infrastructure that always already exists. There's no point trying to create infrastructure because creating infrastructure is expensive and they are not going to be able to pay for that new creation. So you have to make use of the best use of the existing infrastructure. Sometimes government infrastructure exists in many places. Even, for example, when you solve health tech problems, healthcare problems for middle India, you just cannot avoid using the government infrastructure that's already there. A lot of public infrastructure that may be ramshackled, is broken, not working efficiently. But then you can try and work along with it and make it more efficient. The other is that, of course, you should try and um, work with all other service providers that have already established operations. You don't need to create a parallel set of operations. That's something that you can do as well. And when it comes to last mile, for example, farmers are pretty happy picking up, you know, cycling or walking for three, four kilometers to the nearest depot and picking up. This uh, home delivery of stuff is only a convenience that uh, the top 100 million Indians in India, you know, uh, love and can pay for. Farmers have a lot of free time. So you need to design your product or service based on the kind of time and money trade-offs that people or customers make. So in a city, you know, like Mumbai, Bangalore, the customers would trade off in favor of convenience and they would pay more for that convenience. Whereas in, in a village, for example, they're not willing to pay for the convenience because they have free time on their hand. So trying to get them understanding their perspectives and figuring out what service they don't need and using, I said, public infrastructure that's already available instead of, again, building in parallel. So I think that's very uh, important as well. So you have to just fix the gaps in some of the existing services and get those services to work for your product, fit, fit into your scheme of thing at the right place, plug in at the right place. 
Got it. So when we speak of, uh, let's say, the middle India, which might be roughly 500 million, and then maybe the next 700 odd million uh, that typically falls under the aspiring class or the, uh, you know, next billion class, uh, um, that's families or households below the five lakh income bracket. Uh, What do you think is the key to sort of cater to that next segment? is is the only way to uh, sort of help them monetize better. Like like you mentioned, Dehat, I, I think caters to that segment, right? Where they identify, how do I enable farmers to make more money? Or let's say, how do I enable creators to make more money? So basically all of this in, in some way falls under the gig economy, if I may call it. And if that is the case, uh, you know how do you, uh, what what is the future of monetization when it comes to gig economy is it is it local to their specific areas or is the key to sort of bring them outside of their regions and try try to um, you know upskill them to provide services in uh, places where there's more demand i would uh, change the term gig to micro entrepreneurs i think sure. uh, ultimately in india for example i keep saying this you know 15 million people are turning 18 every year or entering employable age every year Whereas you don't have more than, you know, um, half a million high paying jobs available in India. So what do the remaining 14 odd million people do? The reality is that many of them will end up being self-employed. So self-employed or micro entrepreneurs are pretty much the same thing. So you can be either self-employed on your own or you could employ three or four others, five or 10 others, and you can be a micro entrepreneur. So I think we will need to create a lot of these local micro entrepreneurs. Most micro entrepreneurs cannot op- out- operate outside of their locality so it will always be reasonably hyper local so as uh, these uh, micro entrepreneurs will in turn then probably provide uh, products and services to some other bigger aggregators who can then take them across uh, you know different locations or different geographies but i think oh, india needs at this point of time a lot lots and lots of micro entrepreneurs which is people who are solving local problems uh, fixing local inefficiencies and doing it in a very small way and uh, a, a micro entrepreneur could be employing three other four or five or 10 other people. That's it. Got it. And uh, to, a, to an extent, do you think software sort of um, uh, largely, let's say, platform businesses sort of uh, become a bottleneck when we speak about building these micro entrepreneurs? Because at the end of the day, a real innovation might need to happen at the grassroots level where there might need uh, be a need for, let's say, you know, newer products, newer tech, especially in the agri tech space. Uh, you might need new tools, um, so to say. Or uh, so, do you think, to a fair degree, there is lack of concentration towards developing deep tech that that's going to cater more towards these micro entrepreneurs as opposed to just aggregator models that exist today? I think everything has a place, and the aggregator also has a place because what the aggregator does is the aggregator has taken out a lot of friction on the ground. So I would uh, compare economic activity with traffic on a highway or on a city you know, road, which is that from time to time, they get gridlocked, bottlenecked completely. And all that you need to do probably is that get a cop or get at uh, a busy corner intersection who can regulate traffic, or you can just fix up some traffic lights, which will help regulate traffic. So de-bottlenecking is, you know, what the these platforms have done is exactly that, which is de-bottlenecked a lot of economic activity, which has which have been gridlocked. So, for instance, how do you discover a plumber? You, there was no way you could discover a plumber. How do you discover a taxi driver? So these platforms have helped you increase discoverability and also figure out who is good, who can do the job well, because based on every service that's provided, a rating is also provided. So you know who is good, who is not so good. So I think these platforms have created an amazing set sense of de-bottlenecking and remove the friction on the ground. As a result of which traffic, economic traffic has begun to move very smoothly. Now, this is not the be-all and end-all, which is that um, removing this friction is not going to take India, you know, to the next level. You need continuous innovation on the ground. And on the ground, there are several problems that are very difficult for bigger players to go in and solve. So it is in the at the local level, people must come together and try and figure out how to solve some of those problems economically. So there's this book by, uh, you know, Ed Phelps uh, called uh, Mass Flourishing. In that book, he has debunked the concept that, uh, you know, innovation is the result of some big industrialists like, uh, you know, Elon Musk or, uh, you know, even uh, Ford or uh, anybody else. It is very little to do with those big players. Um, uh, You know, society progresses only when modern thoughts percolate deep down into society and in, in actually inspires them to go out and solve problems that are around them. So I think that's what is really necessary. 
sometimes it may need i would say a trigger it may need a catalyst somebody can play the role of a catalyst it can't be for instance a profit seeking venture because uh, that a catalyzing action in itself is not going to make money for anyone so the catalyst has role has to be played by some kind of a non for profit organization government semi government government plus not for profit working together so it's for them to go there and catalyze and unleash some of these energies for example they can go to a small town village and get people together to identify 10 most improbable difficult problems that they're grappling with then they can figure out who is going to benefit from this and then they can figure out how to bring all the stakeholders together to work and solve some of these problems so india's problems for 750 million indians is not easy it's a very difficult path path to prosperity is you know full of mine fields you have to navigate those mine fields so at this point do you think it all boils down to us not having enough clarity on what exactly are the problems on ground uh you, people have clarity i don't think we, we need to we you and i need to have clarity on every problem that india faces across jammu and kashmir to kerala or gujarat to assam mm-hmm. as long as people in those localities have a reasonable clear sense of clarity on what problems they are dealing with and there's somebody to catalyze them into getting into solution mode that's enough it's not necessary for the prime minister's office or any one individual right. to know every single problem that every part of india faces i think the role of these big government offices is to just trigger the right kind of energy create the energy which will then uh, get people to work together so th- this essentially leads me to say that the the people who are actually facing the problem have the biggest incentive to solve it right or at least local bodies around them um, yes. and if that is the case what's what's actually preventing them from going all in and doing it at a faster scale nothing is preventing them they're already doing it so what, okay. what makes us feel that they're not doing it they're already doing it so we we may not know they may not be highlighted they're not a billion dollar unicorn so they're already solving those problems many of them in many lo- parts of india are already solving problems and uh, it just needs to go, uh, you know go on at a probably much better faster pace that's all got it um yeah so maybe. for instance surat for example right surat was a city that was uh, you know uh, had the plague i don't know if you remember it this was when i was in school i think or college school yeah. this was late 80s 70s yeah 80s, 70s 80s yeah. it was like 80s so it was hit with a plague it was one of the dirtiest cities in the world but then the citizens of surat figured out along under the leadership that of the new commissioner uh, figured out that let's solve our problem and today surat is one of the cleanest cities in the country Right. so people are trying to solve their local problems themselves got it uh, and you believe that unless there is some amount of local innovation that there, there's no real potential for large businesses to be built on top of it yeah it's not very easy that's correct sure um yeah maybe maybe i'll take a detour at this point and uh, you know since you've been working with the people team and the hr and you've sort of built with it dealt with team building across startups um what, what do you think constitutes a great team at at very early stages in a startup at a very early stage i think uh, a good team has a sense of ownership which is that uh, they uh, all of them behave like entrepreneurs think and act like founders every single employee in the team early stage team has to think and act like founders and what do founders do which is different from employees founders take ownership for instance when they come into a you know meeting room and the meeting room from the previous day is not cleaned they're not going to wait for the office boy to come and clean up they will clean up the meeting room and make red make it ready for this meeting so i think they are willing to take ownership and do whatever it takes you know to get the desired outcomes that they're aiming for so i think uh, early stage team needs to be able to be agile Uh, act with a sense of speed and urgency demonstrate a uh, tremendous amount of ownership uh, be very crazily customer centric understand who their customers are and focus on building things which uh, they love getting continuous feedback from all of them and it's not just external customers there are people in the team who are serving internal customers as well so they have to behave and treat those people as internal as customers so there should be a very strong across the board uh, maniacal focus on customers so i talked of maniacal focus on customers both internal as well as external very strong sense of ownership speed and agility in everything that they do i think uh, is is very critical and thinking and acting like founders in summary uh, and do you think this is particularly relevant to let's say um, institutional investors backed businesses or is it true even for let's say bootstrap companies it's true uh, for every it's, it's true for every comp- startup early stage startup 
would would you sort of agree if i say um you know people who tend to have a lot of ownership in the very early stages um it's very unlikely that they're going to stick in the longer term uh, as far as the company is concerned because i i remember nitin kamath speaking about this in one of the interviews where he mentioned that uh, you know the the attrition rate at zeroda has been very uh, low right people people really stick to the team and uh, often uh, Zerola is one of those companies that is not, you know, just uh, throw ESOPs at people. Uh, in fact, ESOP is a very recent concept as far as Zerola is concerned. And if that is the case, what 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 really is the incentive to sort of keep people, st- uh, you know, stuck for the long term? And is ownership a criteria that's a deal breaker? Ownership uh, means what? What did you mean by ownership? Did you uh, mean stock options? Ownership of. Uh, yeah that, that's one way in which you can sort of uh, compensate oh, for that was ownership. not the way i defined ownership yeah ownership. i meant like product ownership i get that but i, I was no, asking... i was talking about ownership means feeling a sense of ownership which is i am responsible for this i will feel sleepless if a new feature is being launched because i'm going to be worried whether the feature is going to work or not whereas employees may not feel very sleepless you know they might feel okay let's the feature is being launched tomorrow let's see what happens so but uh, somebody who takes ownership is going to feel very very sleepless about it but don't you think ownership and incentive is sort of closely linked uh, what what gives people enough reason to sort of own what they're doing especially yeah, yeah. in so a high risk company so i think everything is not entirely driven by extrinsic factors there are some people who naturally take more ownership than the other sure. folks so that's very uh, different some people inherently don't take the ownership and um, i think you know the monetary part which you're talking about financial incentives i think they just simply uh, cement a naturally ownership taking person so they cement that ownership behavior you cannot create ownership by with stock options of financial incentive with people who don't take that ownership naturally there are some people who take ownership there are some people who don't take ownership i can give you so many stories there's no time today for this but uh, i've seen so many examples of people who take ownership and they didn't take ownership because they were invested in stocks they had stock options or anything of that kind naturally right. taking ownership so let's say when when you were trying to uh, you know hire people at any stage how do you uh, you know what's one trait that um, gives you validation okay that this person is someone who could take ownership like what's one marker for ownership yeah i think that's uh, difficult to say what is that one marker for ownership uh, but during the uh, conversation i think you can figure out uh, a lot of traits and ownership to me is uh, some you know to me uh, indicated by for example an individual demonstrating self leadership being able to take the initiative not waiting for something to break down not waiting to be told you need to do this uh, it's about uh, taking that initiative going that extra mile so you can figure out during the course of that interview whether this person is going to take that initiative will you know go that extra mile uh and those kind of things so you, i think you can check for instances in her past life when they have demonstrated some of these behaviors when you know things were not completely under their control what did they do right. you know that showed that they went the extra mile so asking questions about their past lives and figuring out for examples i think is one way of figuring out pretty much anything that you want to interesting self leadership um uh, so when we speak of um, you know people sort of trying to take an initiative and stuff like that uh, how do you uh, let's say you know how do you distinguish if if they are being um, you know driven by incentive if they are being driven by the mission of the company if they are being driven by let's say working for the specific founder even for a candidate who who's sort of demonstrates self leadership right how do you sort of know if they are going to stick with you in the longer run as far as the company is concerned there was this story in mahabharata in which uh, karna was known as a very generous person you know that right yeah he was known as an extraordinary generous person so duryodhana for instance thought you know what karna is being respected and he's got such adulation because of his generosity so let me also try and be generous so mm-hmm. uh, it was uh, the rainy season the monsoons and someone went and asked you know uh, duryodhana i need firewood and he duryodhana response was how can i get you firewood in this monsoon there is no dry wood available at all so you have come to me at the wrong time and then he went to karna's house karna broke down his house took out the timber and gave it to this guy 
So here we are distinguishing between two people who are one who's inherently generous and one is trying to pretend to be generous. Here also in companies, you will find people who know who are trying to be loyal to you because of incentives and people who are inherently loyal to you. I'm not for the moment saying that the two are completely different in the sense that you, that you should not uh, retain the inherently loyal people with good stock options or give compensate them well. You certainly need to. But the two are very different. There are people, a bunch of people who are deeply, deeply drawn towards a mission. They're deeply drawn towards staying with that mission and going through ups and downs when they're you know, going through that journey. And a good, fair compensation and fair set of retention you know, programs are enough to cement that attitude. But there are people who are going to stay with you only for stock options. You can spot them. It's not very difficult. You know, uh, it's like the Duryos. There will be situations yeah, yeah. when it comes out, the true nature comes out. Interesting. So, uh, you know, when, when we're speaking of, um, you know, these layoffs and companies trying to optimize for their operations and costs, um, layoffs are inevitable. But do you think, what do you think is reasonable for a company to do? Uh, should they try to optimize costs for sustaining their current level of operations and scale? Or should they sort of drop down their operations and scale uh, to maybe survive and th then maybe look at hitting it back? I, I didn't exactly. So are you saying that companies, uh, uh, what, sh what should be the attitude to layoffs? How should they optimize um, uh, and no, uh, lay, no, lay off I, people, I'm or should they remain a bit suboptimal, keep that higher workforce? No, I'm asking if uh, if there should potentially be more layoffs uh, for you know companies to just generate some level of sustainability for a longer run, as far as the winter is concerned, so to speak, um, and then maybe they can again begin to upscale their operations. Do you think that's okay. that's a reasonable approach? I mean, that depends on many situations. My own belief is that don't hire crazily, which is that don't hire recklessly because if you hire recklessly, you will fire recklessly. So it, all of this to a large extent depends upon many things. One is the founder mindset. One set of founders, you know, when there's an opportunity, they will just go ahead and hire hundreds and thousands without being sure whether that opportunity in front of them is real, whether it's going to last for lo long, whether they can be, you know, it's a temporary fad, whether it will last or not. And then when things don't turn out as they predicted, they will fire those people. A second set of founders are going to be very thoughtful. You know, is that opportunity for real? I mean, have we seen this in the past? Uh, you know, uh, these are fads which come and go. So let it, let the trend, uh, you know, uh, stay for some time longer. And then I will begin to hire. And I will hire more thoughtfully and slowly. So I think it depends upon the mindset of the founder, whether you are willing to hire and fire recklessly or whether you want to hire and fire more thoughtfully. That's the difference. And I think the world is a free world. You know, the contract between employees and employees is a free world. So people can do what they want and employees can also figure out after a period of time, which is the right companies to work for probably. So I think this is also the reason why I asked this question, right? Because you brought up the uh, idea of, you know, product market fit. Does the company know that it's here to stay and only then it makes sense to hire recklessly or, uh, you know, chase growth at that point. Um, so that, that brings me to this concept of timing, right? Like, how do you know whether it's it's time for something that you're building to be accepted by the market? Uh, is it largely to do with the timing for the space or is it more to do with, uh, you know, timing for your specific idea? And how would you, let's say, differentiate uh, or justify the idea of timing when it comes to new category defining? Yeah, so, let me, so let me just illustrate this with an example. So you know the idea of LTV, right? You know the idea of CAC as well. Lifetime value, yeah. Now just take uh, the ratio of the two, LTV to CAC. To me, that's a magical ratio. It is a very powerful indicator of product market fit. LTV is really, you know, a product of your revenue into your margins div divided by your churn rate. So higher the churn, lower the LTV, lower the churn, higher the LTV, it's obvious. Now, if you divide it by CAC, CAC is the marketing spend divided by new customers acquired. So it's the two ratio of the two. Now, if you just look at this, the higher the ratio to me, higher the product market fit, better the product market fit, because the ratio is high if you are getting high revenue, if the quality of your revenue is good, quality of your revenue means margin is good and your churn is low. So churn is low means your product market fit is better. Margin is high means your product market fit is better and revenue is high, repeat revenue is high means it's better. And similarly, when CAC is low, your PMF is better. CAC is low means word of mouth. You're not spending a lot of money to advertising. People are, you know, advertising for you. People are telling their friends. So if you look at, apply this principle to a company like, let's say, a Zepto, you can apply this across the board. 
So one might say Zepto is creating amazing customer experience and that gives it the right to grow. To me, customer experience is not an indication of product market fit because if you deliver free products to your customer, right. you will never make money, but you will create an amazing experience, right? You can create an amazing. So to me, it is not just customer experience. So I talked about the quality of the revenue as well. In LTV, there's an element called quality of revenue, which is margins. If a business is not making margins, whatever customer experience to deliver, there's no product market fit. Right. So Zepto is not creating a product market fit because they are in hugely negative zone in terms of margins. And there's a big doubt on whether this business model will ever be profitable or not. So if you hire large numbers of people with this assumption, you will end up laying them off. Whereas mm -hmm. some of the company would not, you know, uh, go in and hire a large number of people because they would really believe that this is not yet indication of a PMF, which means that I don't know where the customers will shop with us when we raise prices, because only when we raise prices will our PMF be tested. Only when we raise prices and be, go on the path of profitability, let's see if customers are still willing to buy with us and how much are they willing to buy. That's when we'll begin to hire. So I think, uh, you know, having a product market fit is about understanding what it really means. Just because your customer experience is awesome does not mean a great PMF at all. Got it. But may, may, maybe I'm taking a detour here, but I, I, I'd i like to understand how would you look at, uh, you know, timing for, let's say, companies like Facebook, right? Or, or let's say any social media whatsoever, share chat when it came in India. Uh, the, do you think there's a very profound reason why 2015 was the right time for share chat to be introduced and be adopted in India? Or let's say if we take an example of a company like Beeriel, which is again in the social space, um, it really took two to two and a half years before it hit that exponential growth phase. So how do you know if it's it's worth sticking on, if it's worth uh, dropping the idea? How do you define that? Very difficult, uh, uh, Krishna, on this. I really have no answer. I don't think any person really will give you a good answer because if that's the case, you know, you would not have had many companies collapsing. So I think then some businesses, though, to me, have to necessarily be built, uh, you know, in a very aggressive way. Just so, for example, uh, some businesses and business models are amenable to a winner-take-all kind of a situation. So, for example, a platform like Facebook is, uh, I would say, uh, is driven by the idea of a network effect. And when network effect operates, it's pretty much the winner-take-all, or the early player has a big has a big advantage. So, in those kind of businesses, I think you need to go out and grab territory, grab market share and buy out market share, which means that you give a huge amount of discounts and you need to burn a lot of capital. So that business also relies on easy capital being available. So in some situations, easy capital is also available. So I think many factors sometimes come together depending on the nature of the business and the nature of the business model. Not all business models are amenable to a network effect or winner take all, right? So in this kind of a space, I think it's okay as long as there are, you know, funds which are willing to bet on you and willing to say, you know, let's burn this money. Let's get market share. We'll figure out whether this business is sustainable, profitable or not. But so don't you think it's the similar approach to, let's say, a Zepto or a Dunzo where, um, you know, institutional investors are trying, let's grab market share. Let's, let's try. Yeah, but that market share grabbing is not going to prevent anybody else from coming in. Say for, I'll, tell, I'll tell you what, market share grabbing is helpful mm -hmm. if it creates an entry Network barrier effect. for new players. Right. If it cannot create entry barriers for new players, then there's no, there doesn't help you in any way. For example, WhatsApp, once it spread, it created an entry barrier for other players because of the network effect. Everybody's on WhatsApp, so you're on WhatsApp. You're on WhatsApp because everybody's on WhatsApp. It's reverse. It's placed that way, right? So market share grabbing by burning capital is helpful when it acts as an entry barrier for other players who are trying to come in. It should be such a deterrent for somebody else to come in that I can't even play in this place because the market share is taken by somebody. And for me to create even a little bit of market share, I have to burn unlimited capital. But in case of Dunzo or Zepto, there's that, that market share is not going to get them any uh, you know, advantage in the sense that they have to at some point of time raise prices. It's not going to prevent anybody else from coming in. Got it. I, I get what you're speaking about the network effects, right? As long as you've grabbed the market share and it's created a massive network, uh, there's inertia to sort of move on and try a new product. So maybe that's that creates an entry barrier. But while network effect is certainly one of the criteria, don't you think it's also the fact that there is any improvement that could be done to, let's say, a messaging platform like WhatsApp today will, will be very incremental so much 
that it's not enough reason for people to migrate. Uh, do you think part of the reason is because there's not enough improvement to be done, not enough innovation to be done in a particular space, which is what creates that entry barrier? I did fully understand this question. I know that, uh, uh, you know, WhatsApp is serving a purpose and you're saying that, you know, making... Uh, How much more can you improve it? It's yeah, going to be incremental. You're probably right, but you're, what's, what's the question, but? Uh, the question is, is that one of the major reasons for entry barrier or is it just network effects? Oh, I think it's largely network effect. My opinion is that uh, okay. it's network effect, which is you will never go to Signal because none of your friends are on Signal. You can't, uh, you know, message with anyone on Signal. So... Sure. Um, interesting. And uh, okay, so what what do you think uh, it defines a founder who is able to you know maybe tackle such problems? Particularly since you you come from an angel uh, experience, right? How do you you know make these early bets on founders, especially very young founders who might not have enough experience? And uh, you're probably putting in checks at idea stages. Where, where maybe the TAM is big enough and maybe the guy seems enthusiastic enough. But uh, many factors, like you mentioned, right? We, we would never know how the LTV versus CAC ratio would pan out um, in the future. So how do you make these early bets as an angel? As an angel, early bets, I, I make just based on, um, you know, founder traits, a few founder traits. Uh, I, I, it should be very easy to have a conversation with the founder. The founder should be no nonsense, no jargon down to earth, be able to explain things in very simple terms that a six-year-old can understand, um, can very easily say, you know, I don't know, which is that uh, in a, a conversation, it's an easy conversation. At no point of time do I get the feeling that this person is pretending to know all the answers, which is willing to say, oh, yeah, I, I, I have never thought about this. It's a good point. Let me think about this. So if a person, that conversation has bits of these pieces, to me, it's a very strong thing. And also being able to use first principles in thinking. Because I think, you know, many problems that you deal with as a founder, you would never have dealt with them before. So the only way you can grapple with them is your clarity of thought, your understanding of first principles, common sense, lots of common sense, you know, understanding the right, having the right kind of beliefs, for example, alignment with the right kind of beliefs. Uh, for example, belief could mean, for example, I want to build a business sustainably. Profitability is important. There are many ways in which some of the belief alignment can happen. So I think for me, these things matter. I don't really care about, you know, the market I, because I can never understand because how can I understand SaaS? How can I understand the social messaging? There are mm -hmm. millions of domains. How can I understand all of them? I don't understand probably 90% of those domains. Right. So my bet is on the founder and founder traits. So it, it kind of boils down to authenticity. Yeah, authenticity. And, yep, that's correct. Authenticity. And obviously that should be a sense of, uh, you know, drive and hunger to do things, make a change. Very, very passionate. Got it. Um, sure. So uh, maybe again, switching topics here, but uh, I think 2016 to 2018, uh, you were sort of this LinkedIn top voices. Uh, so at some point you've been active on social media. And there's a question I, I ask a lot of people these days, right? Off late, if you look at what, what's needed to sort of win against social media algorithms, it's consistency to a fair degree. You put yourself out there every day and put yourself as vulnerable as you can. Um, there's a higher chance that more people are going to, um, you know, stick to your content. Um, now, another school of thought would be to say that, okay, the longer I take to create a certain piece of content, there's a higher probability of it having more quality or value, whatever that might mean. So how do you sort of look at this balance between, let's say, consistency versus quality when it comes to content? I think you should just be yourself. Uh, not everybody uh, 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 is the same. So I think you should just not worry too much about what it means on the social media. I think you should put out, if you are if you care about quality, then you should put out quality content. If quality you cannot create more than twice a week or more than once a week, then put out once a week. If you want to be out there, you know, putting out all the little wisdom that you have or you know, copy paste some interesting quotes and make a tear jerking kind of a pose, that's what you love, you can stay too with that. So I think uh, it's a choice that you need to make. Uh, say, I, I, I don't think you really need to, you know, think about whether a particular post would be, you know, get likes or not. But I think it's okay to think whether a particular post is insightful to my target audience. Would they like it? Would they derive value from it? So I think you should just be who you are. 
Sure, but then it, it kind of becomes a battle against the algorithms where you might not get as much reach as, reach as you yeah, expect. So that, that, yeah, so you're talking of an individual or you're talking of your startup, of a company? I, I'm just talking in general. If you're talking about of an individual, I can only talk about myself. So for instance, uh, I can clearly see that a certain type of posts get far more liking than uh, a certain other set of posts. For example, right. in, in any communication, there's something called logos, pathos, and ethos, right? Aristotle. So ethos, for instance, for whatever reason, seems to get a disproportionate share of likes. If there is a lot of ethos, sorry, not ethos, pathos, pathos in mm -hmm. your post, pathos in your article, that gets a lot of likes. And pathos really means emotion. It has to touch right. you. It has to touch mm -hmm. your soul. It has to touch your heart. It has to touch the soul of millions of people who are on social media. So those tend to get disproportionate amounts of likes. So is the question, do I put out pathos focused posts only because they get likes? Do I avoid logical posts called logos? No, I, I do a mix of the two. I've seen, for example, some posts that I put out recently on you know, uh, uh, you know thinking fast and slow. I found it very insightful, but probably that got only 60 likes. Mm -hmm. But I put out a post of a beautiful entrepreneur I met in Pune who's mm -hmm. building a book, uh, you know, mobile bookstore on wheels. And that post got for some 400 likes. Uh, but both the posts are authentic from my perspective. In a sense, I needed to put out a thinking fast and thinking slow. I didn't care whether it'll get likes or not. I knew it won't get likes, but I knew that right. there will be some 50 people who will find a powerful takeaway. And the post on that other founder who created this mobile bookstore, I knew it's got elements of pathos in it. It's got elements of emotion, beautiful story. There's a beautiful story of that founder. And I knew it'll get likes, but I knew that the story is important for me. It's important for every founder. So I just put out based on what I feel touched by. I don't care about whether it's got pathos only, pathos more, logos less, which will get likes. No, I just feel that I need to share this. And that's And that's true for me. Yeah, and I, I think I, I've also uh, recently read a post by Nitin Kamat which speaks something similar, right? And, and this might largely be true for people who are, let's say, creating content uh, as just another thing. It's, it's a way to express yourself, right? Because mm -hmm. let's say your daily bread does not depend on that. But when we speak of, let's say, the creator's economy, uh, pe people are creating content to make money, to, to, uh, to get those likes, to get those impressions, yeah, to get yeah. the engagement and bread. Correct. Uh, so... How do you look at the space from that perspective? See, that is not something I really uh, am knowledgeable enough to comment on. Sure. Uh, what uh, these creators should do. Okay. Um, so again, going back to the investment. Uh, but um, I can only um, you know, comment on that at a very first principles level. My first principles response is that everybody needs to build a brand that's authentic. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's it, I would say. So you need to build a brand which is authentic and do what you feel is uh, natural to you. Sure. So going back, going back to the investment um, genre, right? Um, how do you look at, I mean, venture investing is a high risk game. Uh, and it, it requires a certain level of understanding of the space and understanding of how capital works in the space uh, to sort of be comfortable with putting in money in the space, right? So how do you look at, let's say, companies like Tyke or Grip Invest that are sort of looking at democratizing venture investing, where, where they say, okay, Common people can put in ticket sizes as low as five thousand, and uh, you know invest in startups. How do you look at this from from a founder perspective, right? Do you think it's it's a good way to sort of raise capital? Um, and if so, is it uh, relevant only to certain sectors of uh, certain businesses that you create, uh, or is it true across domains? I, I don't understand this a lot. So, for example, when people put in uh, elements, you know, ticket sizes of 5,000 rupees, I'm assuming that not all of them will be on the cap table. They Only one individual or one entity will be on the cap table representing all these small investors, I'm assuming. Possible, yeah. So, if that's the case, I really don't know how it makes a difference for the founder. So, it, I think it's only as long as the investors are putting in that money and um, they are, you know, staying within their risk appetite and not just being casual with... Uh, you know, their hard-earned money, it should be fine. So, for example, if, uh, you know, uh, investor whose annual earnings is, let's say, 20 lakhs, is going to put 10 lakhs in venture investing, that's the wrong thing to do. It's, I think right. it's a big risk. Right. But if they are willing to put 50,000, 10,000 rupees, I think that's perfectly all right because they're, as part of their entire portfolio, this is a small component. 
Fair enough. But but it's also true that, uh, I mean, investing in ventures makes sense only if your portfolio is large enough, right? So although yeah, you're yeah. putting, let's say, a low ticket size like 20,000 per startup, it wouldn't yeah. make sense unless yeah. you're putting it in 10 startups. Um, correct. You know, that's and a and you're putting that in 10 startups. Right. That's correct. Uh, so from that perspective, uh, it, it's highly unlikely that anyone who is, let's say, using a platform like Tyke is going yeah. to fall into that bracket, right? Who can put in, let's right. say, 2 lakhs. And if they were in a position to put in 2 lakhs, they would rather do it themselves, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so what would you think of, let's say, venture debt versus uh, venture capital? Uh, do you think debt is a better uh, medium to enforce founders to think about profitability uh, or sustained growth from, from the start? Yeah. So uh, debt is something that I think that when you don't want to dilute, for example, right? Yeah. You can take a bridge loan kind of a thing, which is that uh, you are uh, wanting to raise money, but you have not met some of your operational metrics or any other metrics that you think uh, are helpful for getting you the right kind of valuation at the next round. And you want to wait for some more time, but you're running out of money. Then probably you could raise some venture debt uh, as a bridge from now to, let's say, six months till you, by when you think you would be ready to raise an equity round. So I think from that, from that perspective, uh, venture debt is helpful. And venture debt is also helpful if you're, uh, you know, raising, a, if you're generating good enough cash by which you can pay interest and then you don't have to dilute. You can, uh, you know, get a bigger bang for the buck for the existing equity holders. So I think some circumstances where, where debt is always helpful. See, debt has always played a role, whether it's in a private company or a public company, right? Debt is a double-edged sword. So, for example, if your company is doing well, if you have leverage, which is high leverage, which is high debt, then what it does, it is amplifies the returns for your shareholders. Sure. So debt amplifies the returns for your shareholders when you are doing well. But when you don't do well, it kills your shareholders okay. because your shareholders are left with nothing and your company can be declared bankrupt. So it's a double edged sword. And I think it's no different from in, in that case of a startup as well. So I think debt is something that you can borrow, use when you're reasonably sure that your company is startup is sound. It's just a timing issue. You're not currently getting your operate, operating metrics that you think are very essential for the next level of fundraise. And you want to you know, raise some debt fixed, in, uh, fixed uh, amount of money that you can re return at some point of time without you know, giving away value. So that's, I think, uh, the same principles apply broadly. It's a double-edged sword. You should use it judiciously under the right set of circumstances. True, I, I get what you're saying, but is it also not true that let's say when there is a certain amount of um, you know pressure to sort of cater to your shareholders and let's say when you're dealing with debt, it kind of drives you to um, you know innovate on what what what's needed to survive and what's needed to generate those profits to keep it going. Uh, I'm asking from a perspective of is debt better to sort of uh, help the company run better as opposed to, let's say, um, equity when you're diluting equity. Uh, uh, the, the way I think about it is uh, this is somewhat, if you allow me to say, it's putting the you know, cart before the horse because mm -hmm. I think innovation is something which is deeply inherent and it should not be driven by, you know what, I will take debt and force myself to innovate. You have right. to innovate whether you take debt or not. You can't put yourself into a situation where you say, I'll get into the deep shithole and that will force me to, you know, struggle and learn the art of, uh, you know, solving problems and getting out of difficulties. You can learn the art of solving problems and innovating even without the debt. I think the debt, whether to take debt or not, should be driven by the right financial reasons. And I talked about some of those. Right. I may not have talked about some others as well, but it should be driven only by that. And innovation should be something that you should attempt under all circumstances. But would you also agree that, uh, you know, let's say the moment I'm diluting a certain percentage of equity for some capital that uh, reduces my risk. So I, I am sort of, uh, I still continue to innovate, but there's a, a bigger playground for me to experiment and uh, where the chances of failure is rather high. Yeah, well, you can look at it that way if you wish to, but I think um, your ability to innovate should not get diluted because you have got diluted. Sure. Uh, uh, more so and, and from, you know what what would you recommend to founders uh, you know who do you think is an ideal investor on your cap table is it someone who is an operator angel or is it someone who's putting in passive capital or is it a vc like what do you think is the best kind of investor on your best cap is table? someone who um, i think uh, has been an entrepreneur before that's my perspective 
because only an entrepreneur can completely understand an entrepreneur you know someone who is fresh out of harvard business school has no experience in building operating a startup will be an excel venture capitalist will never deeply understand the trouble they can say all the right things but never will deep have the deep empathy that our investors need to have for founders so i think first of all um investors who been entrepreneurs to me is a number one choice then uh, in terms of uh, you know i would say without interfering without uh, you know being very nosy but willing to offer help willing to make the right kind of connections and uh, willing to step in and uh, you know help me solve a problem when i ask for that help sincere be willing to help i think that's another thing but asking for reports every day every week you know updates and progress that to me is not that uh, that's not the kind of investor i i, I like to it is so supportive but, but supportive yet a, a bit i would say uh, uh keeping a little distant which is that not interfering supportive but not interfering got it uh but but at very early stages is it also not true that uh, you know a founder might need a lot of you know let's say advice from um, the yes, yes, absolutely so i'm an angel investor on um, uh, at many early stage startups so i'm happy to provide advice when they come to me but right. i'm never going to go to them and say i think you need my advice you're not doing well why right. this says this but i can say for instance these are five things that i think i can help you on so reach out to me whenever you wish to so that that's the thing i'd like so okay there's also this um, sort of belief uh, maybe it's also a fact that uh, you know a large degree of um, startups that raise angel or pre seed rounds do not really make it to the next round uh, so why, why do you think most of these startups fail startups are solving very difficult problems so uh, ultimately the startups fail because customers are not willing to pay for the product or service that can make them sustainable it's as simple as that so you survive and remain sustainable provided you make money so they don't have a product that founders uh, sorry that uh, customers are willing to pay for i think that's as simple as that so they are taking a chance so for example they believe that this is a problem that's worth solving they take a chance but maybe they are wrong so they will figure many of them will be wrong that's the reality and the other element of see the real uh, the other element of entire idea of vc startups is that it's not enough to build a small and profitable company right you have to build an excessively successful scalable company right. and how many ideas are excessively successful and scalable not many okay. but you can build profitable businesses there are millions of kirana stores around you right. they are all startups which have succeeded but they have not scaled uh, in the same way that vcs would expect them to so from that perspective it's not easy to build and therefore most fail so uh, how how do how do you as an angel or even let's say a vc identify if something could be scalable in the longer run particularly if it's category defining yeah so i think that's uh, uh, those some you have to do some simple test which is that what's the market potential what's the market opportunity i mean that it's a million dollar question because you can define a market as uh, 10 billion dollars somebody else can redefine the same market as <laughs> half a billion dollars right so that in itself is a big so assuming for a moment you can figure out what the market size is you can ask 100 intelligent questions and figure out what the market size is and i think so this reminds me of uh, a conversation i was hearing by ashwath damodaran where you know in the early stages of valuating uber uh, someone had valuated uber as a um, cab business and uh, ashwath came and said okay no this is a logistics business so the yeah. valuation just went up 100x yeah Uh, right. but that being said uh, isn't uh, okay i mean keeping the tam aside the, really the market that you can cater to uh, it, it sort of boils down to what your proposition is right uh, what would be the space we we might tell e-commerce is so uh, you know so many billion dollars but for the kind of product that you're offering and the kind of uh, people that it caters to or the customers it caters to there's a finite market share or a market cap that you can attain um uh, and okay you can always make pivots at, at a certain stage but how do you sort of make that early decision and say okay this this might have a large enough potential or not i'm asking so if there is a specific an, marker yeah. so yeah so let's take an example real example so which is that uh, if somebody an entrepreneur comes to you and tells you you know what in india there are you know 10000 tier 2 tier 3 cities 
they don't have access to apollo and fortis hospitals very few of them access they don't have access to the kind of specialists that are available in those kinds of hospitals and they tell you real life stories in terms of you know how difficult it is for people from these tier three towns to travel to a bangalore or a delhi and to get an appointment with a particular specialist and where do they stay in delhi for that period and how do they get that appointment all of that for example right that's a big problem to be if you just listen to that carefully you'll figure out it's a big problem now waiting to be solved now they say that we have a technology based solution where a doctor in a tier 3 city along with the patient can jointly consult without having to travel to a hospital in apollo so they're able to consult that with that specialist without having to travel it's up to you to figure out whether what the solution that they're having is workable scalable or not but they're solving a big enough problem so they are saying you know what we'll get people, we will you know win these tier 3 hospitals across india and we'll tie up with hospitals in tier 1 cities and create this connect so to me it sounds like they're solving a big problem so and you have to listen to the data we do some cross references visit some of these hospitals talk to some of their early customers figure out what they're saying is making sense or not for example does a tier 3 hospital tell you you know what after talking to the startup you know what our life has changed we are able to get kind of kind of treatment that we never could get in the past so listening to the, some conver- doing the first hand conversations with their early customers so that those conversations give you a sense of you know whether the market is big enough or not but uh, yeah ultimately it's about you figuring out whether the market is big enough or not sometimes it may not materialize you'll have to do some pivots along the way sure um so one one thing that you think most founders fail to understand most founders fail to understand most founders fail to understand what is the meaning of scale for them so uh, scale need not be defined in the same way for everybody so f- scale for a facebook is very different from a scale for a smaller you know for a, a startup in a different domain in a different category in a different sector and with a different founder mindset so i think founders have to discover what scale means to them everybody wants to raise a lot of money scale for them is about valuations uh, i think that's probably the biggest mistake which is that you have to find your own meaning of scale and build the business the way you think is right but is it also not true that let's say uh, the moment you get into the venture capital game let's say you've raised a seed or a series a round uh, at that point it only makes sense for you to continue to raise um, instead of going public early and if that if you if you're going public early as let's say a small cap company you were into venture scale business in the first place right right so what is the question uh, so is it, isn't it inevitable that you know people continue to raise and raise and raise go and yeah, raise zoho did not raise any, zoho did not raise any money but it was bootstrapped completely right yeah but they did not raise any money they did not raise vc money infosys did not raise vc money tcs did not raise huge amount of vc money tcs is bigger than ibm so for sure but for for a startup that has raised let's say one or two rounds yeah. let's say i raise a seed and a series a uh, it's inevitable that i have to raise for the rounds don't you think not so not necessarily so I, that's the point i'm making which is that you don't have necessarily infosys also must have raised a series a round i am assuming Okay. But then okay. they became profitable very early on and then they realized why should they raise any more money? So internal accruals were enough to scale and grow the business. So they never raised any more money. So not every business needs to raise money continuously which is you need to stop raising money when your internal accruals are good enough. Okay. So if you were to build a startup today what what space or what startup would you build? What <laughs> so i i i think you, every founder should build a startup based on a problem that she is passionate about it cannot be that i will build an e-com business saas business because the potential is big so i think you should just be uh, passionate about solving a particular problem and uh, that's it i think nothing else should determine what kind of a startup you build interesting and, and let's say if uh, you were a 20 year old today what what would you do for a career today in india in india what would i do for a career yeah if you were a 20 22 year old so as a 22 year old now would, would have been better than what they were when i was a 22 year old i i think i would have started up that tried something i would try to build something got it i, I think you you graduated in mid 80s right and at that yes, point yes. Uh, you know the the world of startups or the world of tech wasn't even so um, rampant as it is today 
Correct. Um, and tech or the Silicon Valley, as we know it today, wasn't the case. So what gave you that early decision to sort of go towards management soon after you graduated? Yeah, so uh, the reason for my doing uh, an MBA was not to get a foothold outside of engineering, uh -huh. like in the case of many individuals, because I was genuinely interested in engineering. So the reason why I did an MBA back to back was that I just wanted to understand uh, a little more holistically about how companies operate. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I from time to time I've been hearing that it's not just your engineering knowledge, you're dealing with people, you're dealing with finances, you're dealing with P&L. So you need to understand many of those things to be effective in a company. So I thought, let me do an MBA. So for the first 11 years, I actually worked uh, as a mechanical engineer on the shop floor in steel melting shops, blast furnaces, coke ovens. Got it. So, and what, what gave you this uh, drive to jump towards startups after having worked? So it was not floor? a drive to jump towards startups. Actually, it was a, a lot of things in my life have been accidents. So at okay. some point, I just really realized that Tata Steel wasn't the best place for me because I was a rule breaker, wanted to get things done quickly, didn't want to seek permission from 10 people before, you know, uh, doing something good. So I realized that I just wanted to, you know, work at a more agile place where uh, there would be a lot more freedom and empowerment. And I just happened to, uh, you know, join Daksh. Daksh was an exciting place and I realized the startups are exciting places. So it was not that I wanted to work for a startup. I was at that point of time, my decision was really to get out of Tarasi and work for at a more agile place and more empowered place. Interesting. Uh, and before we conclude, sir, what, what's one piece of advice you would like, like to give to a very early stage entrepreneur? I would, uh, somebody had asked me this question, so I have a better answer than this one, for this one, which is, I think you just need to really be very passionate about whatever you choose to do. I think deeply committed and passionate about whatever you choose to do. And uh, some things that you learn in life is that there is no destination. So okay. just enjoy the journey, enjoy the ride. Okay. And um, while, while, let's say someone might be passionate about just the idea of building a business, what what's one piece of advice to you for them to pick the right kind of business? Oh, picking the right kind of business to me is very simple. I think you should just solve a problem that you feel deeply committed to. And sometimes you feel deeply committed to a problem because you've experienced that problem personally. And sometimes you may not have experienced that problem personally, but still, you know, while thinking about multiple things in life, you just felt that this is the kind of problem you wanted to solve. So I think to me, that's the best way of uh, picking the right. You, I don't think that you can just pick a problem based on, you know, let me lay out 20 pro you know, possible problems and evaluate all those problems against market opportunities, profitability, scalability, all those, and then identify. It. I mean, some people can do that. I'm sure there's nothing wrong with that, but that's not the way I would do that. And therefore, I, I don't have any advice for anybody. I can just tell you what I would do. I would just pick a problem that I am deeply committed to solving. Got it. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot for your time. And uh... thank you.